Okay, we will just begin. Harvard historian by the name of Sven Beckert um, has written a path-breaking book on New York City's bourgeoisie in the middle of the 19th century. And I'm going to be drawing somewhat on some of the kinds of things that he means to suggest in this important new book. He's described on the whole how the city in the period after the Civil War becomes the center of what he describes as bourgeois American culture and the center of finance capitalism. We've talked about industrial capitalism as the sort of configuration and organization of, around manufacturing sites, and that's more commonplace to industrial cities. New York City is a place that has industry, mostly light manufacturing it's called, rather than in large factories, though it will have plenty of those by the end of the 19th century. But on the whole there, as you're going to see, finishing goods. What New York becomes equally well known for, not just its manufacturing, is that we finance the manufacturing and the industry around the rest of the country. And indeed, to the extent to which many of those corporations will become multinational in their behavior and organization, New York City becomes the center, really, of finance capitalism that is international, just not national. And that all gets consolidated in the 19th century. The backdrop against the making of this New York City bourgeoisie, if you'd like, or is, in fact, that what we've talked about before, and that is that coming out of the 1830s and 40s, New York City also, we had seen, had begun to develop a group of people who had begun to identify themselves as a working class, as a group of people with their own interests for the first time that they saw as having a class basis to it. We saw it in the preamble, if you recall, to the Citywide Trades Council, where they talked about themselves as being basically increasingly in conditions of vassalage in a system that resembled feudal arrangements of rich against poor. So a new kind of awareness that as important as in the past ethnicity might have been, the Dutch versus the English, or black and white, they're now also seeing, for the first time, themselves as having a class interest. And that, of course, would continue even as late as the Civil War and be expressed as both class and race and ethnicity interwoven in an event like the draft riot where people are organizing against the sense that they are that rich people are being privileged and getting out of the war but they're organizing and fighting against another group of poor people who have a different complexion so they're stringing up black folks and they're mostly coming out of a working class that has had strong ties to ethnicity among the Irish. So we see that ethnicity and race are complicating divisions that are also have a class character to them. Well, as important as is the making of a working class in New York City and in other cities is the making of a group of people above them who are also beginning to increasingly identify themselves as having their own interests in common and beginning to articulate it. And that's the group I want to talk about today. So part of the social history is to talk about the working class, and now we're talking about a group above the working class also organizing itself as a class. And it does so sometimes in economic terms, and sometimes it does so in cultural terms. It has what we would call cultural capital, not just political capital or financial capital. And they can all serve one another. Now, the working class had cultural capital, too, as you may recall. That's what faction fighting was. That's a form of cultural capital. That's what the fire brigades, volunteer fire organizations were. They're forms of social and cultural capital around which people organize. And we see that in those expressions, the culture has political meaning. The firemen may be a social group, but they act as a political group at the same time. And that can take fairly informal political or pre-political forms and going out on the street and deciding who to fight for or who not to and can take very self-conscious political forms when the firemen are called out by the city ward politicians to take an active role in policing the elections. 
So it can be both political and pre-political. We'll now pause and see if we can get the PowerPoint to work. We're not getting this up there. So we'll let them play while I continue. The new elites were not just merchants. We've talked about them since the 17th century. Those merchants who, as you recall, were tied to the slave trade and the plantation, but increasingly are manufacturers, retailers, and finance capitalists, bankers in particular, with national and increasingly even international interests. Even as I suggest to you they function as a class, increasingly, and with an awareness of themselves as a class, it will be important to understand they don't always operate as a unified class. They divide over appropriate strategies, over tactics. They agree that they have interests in common, but they aren't always in agreement about how to advance those interests. And some are prepared, as you'll hear, are prepared in dealing with the working class to use the stick, and others are prepared to use the carrot. That's to say, some are prepared to, be, to, to call out the police and be repressive, and others are prepared to make a, an overture to the working class to help them, to advance them, in the hope that by lending a helping hand, they will be more supportive of the interests of this new mercantile financial capitalist grouping. So while we'll see the emergence of a bourgeoisie as a class, the one thing around which they share a fairly common view, according to Beckert, is that they have a common view of what they saw as the dangerous class. That's, they say, they didn't perceive the working class always as a group entirely by itself. They understood it as a group that was often misdirected and misled by a small group of people who were dangerous. And they try also to separate out those who are respectable from those who are not so respectable. Those who are dangerous from those who, with whom they feel they can work. They do agree on possessive individualism. They believe in the role of the individualist and in a society that supports possessive individualism. And it allows them to come together often as a group against slavery, even while they could remain fairly racist, as a way of liberating a free labor force, creating individuals whom they may not like, but who could be employed. So they could oppose Wade, a chattel slavery, but not accept that there was a category that would be called wage slavery as legitimate. The popular expression of their views, I've mentioned in the last couple of lectures. One of them, remember, was the speech by Russell Conwell, that minister, Acres of Diamonds. And I paraphrased some of that, his uh, speech, the one that he gave in every city around the country, and basically just filled in the blanks, I'm here in New York rather than in Poughkeepsie or Rochester or Savannah, and so, okay, from the same speech that he gave everywhere. Not unlike politicians today who give the same speech. It takes a lot of time to write different speeches. So they use the same speech everywhere. And he used the speech as well. And I just was going to read today an excerpt from that because it gives you a flavor of the class and racial dynamics that were informing these attitudes about opportunity and about possessive individualism. He began, now then I say again that the opportunity to get rich, to attain unto great wealth, is here in Greenwich Village today, he would have said in Philadelphia, fill in the blank, okay? Greenwich Village today, and it's within the reach of every man and woman who hears me speak this afternoon, tonight, this morning, whenever he would be talking. And I mean just what I say. I have not come to this platform, even under these circumstances, to simply recite something to you. I have come to tell you what in God's sight I believe to be the truth. 
And the year, if the years of my life have been any value to me in the attainment of common sense, I know I'm right. That the men and women sitting before me to here today, some of you who have found it even difficult to pay tuition to this lecture, just, he said, buy a ticket, okay? Pay tuition to this lecture, have within their reach acres of diamonds, opportunities to get largely wealthy, and there never was a place on earth more adapted than the city of New York today. And never in the history of the world did a poor man without capital have such an opportunity to get rich quickly and honestly as he has now in our city. Read down a little further. He says, I say you ought to get rich. It is your duty to get rich. Now, how many of my pious brethren say to me, do you, a Christian minister, spend your time going to, up and down the country, advising young people to get rich, to get money? Yes, of course I do. And well, they say, why? Isn't that awful? Why don't you preach the gospel instead of preaching about men's making money? Because to make money honestly is to preach the gospel. That is the reason. Remember, this would be called the gospel of wealth. The men who get rich may be the most honest men you find in the community. Oh, but says some young man here today, I've been told that all my life if a person has money, he's very dishonest and dishonorable and mean and contemptible. My friend, that's the reason why you have none. Because you have that idea of people. The foundation of your faith is altogether false. Let me say here clearly, and I'll say it briefly. Though subject for discussion, unfortunately, we don't have, for which I don't have time. 98 out of 100 of the rich men of America are honest. That is why they are rich. That is why they carry on great enterprises and find plenty of people to work with them. It's because they're all honest men. So that's the gospel of wealth, okay? Acres of diamonds, a kind of commonplace in the late 19th century from roughly 1870. It, it's, a, it's a, I think, probably a speech that would have died out probably by maybe 2015, but other, not till, till then it's still gonna go strong. I don't expect it dying out then either. That's to say it's still resonant in many circles. The theorist for this kind of gospel of wealth, was born in Patterson, New Jersey, and he was America's first sociologist or prominent sociologist at Yale. His name was William Graham Sumner, S-U-M-N-E-R. And he's the person who combined the insights of Herbert Spencer and Charles Darwin in what was called social Darwinism that I mentioned to you before as well. Basically, he took the principles of survival of the fittest natural selection, and laws of competition, and applied them to society. Now, in doing this, to give you an example, he was echoing some of the things that Jonathan Winthrop and the Puritans would have said in the 1630s and 1640s. That's to say, God's infinite variety made some people poor and some people rich. There's a natural selection. And the laws of competition would mean that some were going to survive. But everybody has different skills. Some of you run fast and some of you don't. Some of you are good at digging ditches and some of you are better at stealing banks or running banks. I think there's a difference. Okay? So those are just different skills that you all have. And, some, and that's natural selection in its own way. So this was not so foreign. These are ideas long resonant in the culture that are being rearticulated now as a science, as a science of society. So all these attitudes that you're hearing from a preacher like Conwell that were interesting. A, a preacher like Conwell, looks like it's going to happen now. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Ah. Thank you. Excuse me, Glass. Uh, 
<laughs> we thank you. <laughs> no, it'll, it'll just get. I just you can just start it. You're still online. Did you go off? No, no, we're still recording, but I can't get the picture oh, big. Oh, okay. Unless I stop and start it. Okay, we're going to stop and start it for a minute so we can get the picture up. Bravo. Okay, thank you, Michelle. That's the fragment four for game two. It's part of a church in the East Village. Got to find the church and then go around the corner to find that. Oh, and there he is, the Reverend Russell Conwell. We'll see where we go. I'm going to come back if I man, I mean for a minute just to give you a sense of what um, what social Darwinism was like, this kind of dominant ideology, the late 19th century. Uh, one of the things that he talked about, uh, spent um, Sumner, was the forgotten man. Have any of you ever heard the expression the forgotten man or know about it from, another, from other moments in history? Anyone ever heard the phrase the forgotten man? Your American history classes and AP history? Back in the Depression. Roosevelt spoke about the forgotten man. Who do you think that was? Who would you expect that in the Depression would have been identified as the forgotten man? Come on, this isn't hard. Make it up. The Guess. Unemployed. The unemployed. Okay. The Okies, the unemployed, the poor, the destitute, the people who supposedly had been left behind in the Depression and social policy had to be organized to protect and help this person who had been forgotten by society, the forgotten man. That's not who, spent, who, who Sumner's talking about at all. He writes about the forgotten man, and it's in the context of this gospel of wealth. For him, the forgotten man is the savings bank depositor. It's the middle class taxed, overtaxed Americans who are being, not being, not, for whom society is not paying any attention. His response was that what you what was that there were two alternatives in society one possibility was to have let's see if i can remember the formulas it was to be um, liberty inequality would equal the survival of the fittest okay freedom would lead to inequality meaning in this case Think of it really as the variety of human experiences, that some are rich and some are poor. But you could only, that, would, that liberty provide, means that there will be inequality, but it will allow for the survival of the fittest, by which, he, by which he presumed you will end up with progress. So progress was dependent on liberty, free trade, is what they meant by that, a free economy, free markets. The alternative, he said, was being proposed by wild-eyed socialists, and it was equality freedom, equality and survival of the unfit. And by that he meant if you were going to deny, if you were going to emphasize not liberty but equality, you would end up with the survival of the unfit, which was degeneration in society. So he said, if you saw a beggar lying in the street, what was the appropriate thing for a social Darwinist to do? What would be the appropriate thing for you as a good, patriotic, right-thinking, progressive individual who wants to create progress do if you see a mendicant, a beggar lying in the street? What's the proper response? Want to guess? Nothing. Nothing. You walk over them. Okay. Why not? If you bend down and pick them up and give them money, it's a waste of your money. Why are they in the street? They're there because it is because they have they aren't fit. Because they're obviously lazy. So to spend capital, 
to spend money helping that person was simply throwing money away because it wasn't going to change their character and they were simply going to waste that money as well. So it was unprogressive to, be, to presume that, you were going to, that creating equality was in any way going to make America a better society and create our future. So the forgotten man for him was the savings bank depositor. That, the, the idea, by the way, of the forgotten man gets picked up one later time in America's history. It's in the early 1970s. It's picked up by Richard Nixon, who is very much a kind of 19th century man, where he's really echoing the idea that the forgotten man is now middle America. It's the forgotten society, the hard-earning taxpayer again. So those ideas, the kind of yin and yang about who's being hate aided, who's not being aided, all of which underlies fundamental principles about what you think of as justice and how you think society could be organized, can, are struggled with in places like New York from the 17th century to the present. At this moment, you have a rising bourgeoisie that's, in, that's using as its ideology social Darwinism. That's to say, possessive role of individualism. No conception of wage slavery. Rather, the differences between people are simply the natural expression of their natural abilities. And you don't muck about with natural law. Any more that the Puritans would have said, you don't muck about with God's infinite variety. The principle of free trade that they would adopt, though in practice, the principle was not always followed because they did believe in state subsidies, just not in state regulation. You'll hear that echo today in debates about Wall Street. They believe in state subsidies, but not regulation. Okay? Tariffs are state subsidies, as examples. State subsidies would be the building of an interstate highway system as a way of subsidizing mass transit, the automobile industry, suburban housing industry. The tax code is a form of subsidies on whether it's a property tax versus a sales tax. So there are lots of ways in which they acknowledge the role for the state and the most fundamental of course is they absolutely believed in a military. They believe in the state as having a role, a primary role in the protector of property rights. That's to say, of also of their privilege because they didn't see it as privilege. They saw it as simply the fulfillment of their natural ability as honest men. Okay. So the state does have a role to play. It's called the National Guard. And these people were the first to want to call upon the National Guard, as you may recall. Key changes after the Civil War. First, in the role of the state, a national military is created during the Civil War for the first time and used in this country. And as I mentioned to you before, there is the emergence of a welfare system supported by those bourgeoisie as well as poor people, but it was a welfare state that would become defined as something supporting only men and the military. It's the veterans' hospitals. That was a role of the state that they that was accepted. It was the old, virtually the only main role, with one other exception, of course, and that was military and shipping, protecting of shipping and trade on the high seas. So it will be important to remember that by the 1890s, the United States gets involved in a whole series of new military adventures in the Philippines, in Cuba, in the Panama Canal, and in elsewhere, and that all involves the American military and the support of free trade. That's how it's expressed, and it's endorsed as a mission of white civilization. That is a civilizing effort by Christian people. So it comes out of this Russell Conwell kind of Christian philanthropy attitudes, elite Christian philanthropy. The role of New York City capital substantially broadens and gets heightened after the war. And it happens at the same time as the cities are increasingly controlled by working class politicians. So the local politics is increasingly 
seeing the effect and the power of working class communities around Tammany Hall, at the same time as we have this other organization now being created to serve a different, a distinct set of interests. It's not unlike thinking about the irony of a cult of true womanhood emerging in the 1840s, 30s and 40s, at the very moment when working class women have to work in factories. It's not uncommon that ideologies often emerge out of the anxieties created by new social realities at the same time. Okay. The key here for us is the new role of banks and lawyers who work in national banks based in New York City. It's marked by the increasing indebtedness to New York City bankers. Again, we saw this earlier in the slave trade, as you may recall, even in the 18th century. We're really talking now about the penetration of this indebtedness through the culture and through finances of the nation. Okay? We're talking not about something that's new. We're talking about something that's new only in the depth of power and control involved. Okay? New investment bankers are serving finance, not just industry. Who are the new investment bankers? Some of them are names that will be familiar to you. They're New York based. They have national impact, as you would recognize today. Lehman Brothers, Drexel Morgan and Company, Chase National Bank, Seligman Brothers, Lieb and Company, Manufacturers Trust. You might note in some of those names the role of German Jews in some of these banks. It was in fact the one sphere that was often open to Jews who were otherwise discriminated against on Wall Street and other words. And it put these German Jews often in a fairly ambivalent position. They were needed by manufacturers. Their, the money in their banks was needed. They were needed to float loans. They were needed to create new deals. But their power increasingly also created a rising tide of anti-Semitism that emerges in, the, in New York, in particular, in the 1870s and 80s. And it arises even more so as Eastern European Jews come and complicate the image of the Jew for these German Jews who are very wealthy. The city becomes a center for the rise of this new formation we talked about in America called monopoly capitalism, the end of the last half of the 19th century. J.D. Rockefeller, you remember, made his money in Standard Oil, but he owned mines, paper mills, banks, insurance companies, real estate companies. Remember, we talked about that vertical integration. The point is, you say, well, what does Rockefeller and all of this have to do with New York? Most of these people move to New York. They become absentee owners of facilities that are located elsewhere. Rockefeller's mines are in Colorado. He's moving here, as are many of the others that we're largely talking about. The armors in meatpacking arrive in New York in 1864. Carnegie runs the homestead mills and steel in Pittsburgh, where he is a ruthless owner associated with the use of Pinkertons to crush a very famous strike there in 1864, 1894 of workers whose crime was simply to want to unionize. But he, moved, but he lives in New York City as early as 1867. Rockefeller moves here in 1884. Meyer Guggenheim, another Colorado mining magnet, moves here in 1889. The, descent, the Vanderbilts move to New York, become socialites, political figures. Alexander Holly, his statue is in Washington Square Park, is an iron manufacturer in upstate New York, again, lives in 
New York City. So what we begin to have is, in fact, and it's a con national configuration of companies all around the country being run by absentee owners living in New York City who are increasingly engaged in having local people doing the day-to-day -day work there. The relationships to their employees now are no longer personal, they're highly impersonal relationships. The owner never sees the employees at all. There is a new whole level of ownership, I'm sorry, of, of supervision that's created to deal with these people. It's called management. A whole tier of people who are created to run these places and a whole group of people who need to be trained, hired, and employed. It, it will become, after the turn of the century, the emergence of a new social group in New York, white-collar labor. But its origins lie in the development of monopoly capital in these large corporations that need now this whole new apparatus to manage and run it. The point for Beckert is by the end of the 19th century in New York City, we have the organization of a national ruling class in his terms based in New York City. That's to say, a group of people who self-identify with one another. You can come through, just wander through. A group of people who identify with one another and have a national reach with the kind of authority and power that they have, and based in New York City. What makes this class powerful is that its numbers extend not just to those who we might call, and the phrase from our English language is interesting in this case, the filthy rich. It also just includes those people who are just largely wealthy. So it is a much broader class of people. We're not just talking about, I've mentioned Vanderbilt and Rockefeller, but we're not talking about a class that's limited to simply 1%. We're talking about 10 to 15% of the city, and it's made up of the lawyers, the bankers, the real estate agents, the insurance agents, not the agents, but the people who run all of those organizations as well, and embrace the values articulated by Conwell and Sumner. Sumner. Now, this bourgeoisie is united around those sets of attitudes on the whole, and their sense of themselves in opposition to a working class. At the same time, one of the tenets of their organization is to believe that classes don't exist. So one of the things they will spend half their time arguing against is that anybody who talks about class is un-American, even as they, in practice, articulate themselves as a class. The bourgeoisie was divided, however, as I've mentioned before, on how to proceed. Some support the stick of repression and advocated the Metropolitan Police. We've talked about that. Some advocate the use of company spies against workers, and there's a great deal of that. And some advocate and support the establishment of a national armory system, and we saw how that has its origins in New York City, and the deployment of the National Guard, and we saw that as early as the 1830s. They fundamentally, this group, think poverty is rooted in dissolute behavior. That it's rooted in decadent un-American cultures. These people tend to be anti-Catholic and anti-Jewish, anti-Semitic in particular. The second division among the bourgeoisie was among those who supported reform. These were people who, while they could agree upon the virtue of free market capitalism and could agree that class conflict was an un-American description of U.S. conditions, they nonetheless felt badly about what they would define instead as unscrupulous capitalists by people who lacked training and education that consigned people to poverty. For these people, the problem was not capitalism, it was simply bad capitalists. And rather than the stick, they raised the alternative use of the carrot. They sought change 
by changing the habits and thinking of workers so that they no longer would be people who would focus on class conflict. And then finally, a group also related to this group of reformers would be a kind of subdivision of these reformers who, in fact, had a deeper understanding, again, of the problems these workers faced in with their, their environment. Again, it wasn't a group that saw the problem as capitalism, but saw it as environmentalism, that it was the housing of the poor, the lack of their education or family life. Problems, again, were not rooted in the economic system, but were rooted in the conditions that were associated with urban life of the poor. Now, to be fair, some of these reformers didn't neatly divide into one camp or another. Andrew Carnegie, we know, deployed Pinkertons, his private police force, to smash the homestead strike um, at the same time as he uh, protested uh, and uh, at the same time as he made major gifts to libraries all across the country, including to the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen, to whom he gave nearly a half million dollars for their library for working men. His argument, again, was that uh, workers had to be, workers would not go out on strike. They would not, he would not need to call in the Pinkertons if, in fact, they uh, thought properly. And he hoped his libraries would provide them the kind of education that would make them upright citizens, which for him meant citizens who would not go out on strike. In the wake of the Civil War and following the Civil War and the startling news of the Paris Commune, reform movements began. They coincided with the Orange Riots on uh, 7th Avenue. In the wake of the draft riots, we had Protestant um, Irishmen marching who were being attacked by the Green Irishmen or, um, or th through 1871 and 1872, the same time as the Paris Commune. In New York City, a response to that is the creation of a Citizens Association and Council of Political Reform. This was a group that had tried to undermine the Tweed administration that it associated with corruption. And indeed, we know that the Tweed regime was corrupt at the same time as it was aiding working people with jobs. The Citizens Council tried to uh, limit suffrage to the educated and to, well, to the well-heeled. A new effort by similar kinds of reformers was begun in September of 1871, again in the wake of the Paris Commune and these riots, like the Orange Riots, when hundreds of merchants, bankers, and industrialists and professionals, the sort of folk who we know were moving to Chelsea and have been moving to Brooklyn Heights to give themselves some distance from the poor, were moving, move and meet and Cooper, Hall, Cooper Union, where they found, and again, language is instructive here, a committee of citizens and taxpayers for the financial reform of the city and county of New York. Again, committee of citizens and taxpayers. Very instructive that they want to take and lay claim to the fact that they are the people who are paying for social services, and as citizens, they are laying claim to a privileged position um, as uh, loyal Americans, as people who they are arguing have the moral high ground that wouldn't be associated, as they imagined it, with the corruption that they saw with the Democratic Party or Boss Tweed. They, in fact, are claiming to be bipartisan. And they are to the, to, to the extent to which both Democrats and Republicans are represented. But while they are bipartisan, they are uniform, at least, of course, in their attitudes, and that is by class. They are pressing for good government by pressing corruption charges against Tweed as a working class politician or a politician supporting the working class and are arguing that they and their supporters in government will not behave the same way. Now, to be fair, we know that corruption tended to follow all of these folks. It just took off in quite different forms. So they tended to support their allies whether they end up becoming realtors and bankers instead of the working class uh, is often the case. But they form here in 1871 and 72 a committee of 70, named for the 70 members of their executive committee. And they form committee at Cooper's, Cooper Union around the following platform. First, for, first and perhaps most instructive, that they would limit suffrage 
with educational requirements. That's to say, rather than broadening enfranchisement, they saw themselves as limiting it. They were a fundamentally elitist group. They believed in a notion that there was a better class of citizens and a worse class of citizens. They're borrowing from the categories of the respectable and the unrespectable or the dangerous classes that inform their attitudes toward the poor from the 17th, 18th century into the 19th century. They believe the better class of citizens, of course, is represented by men, not women, but men like themselves, elites. Their policy was reflectively largely elitist, but not entirely so. These groups are often fairly complicated. They want to cut taxes and government expenditures. That's to say, they're the taxpayers. They're the ones they see as disproportionately paying for these kinds of things. They don't accept the argument that they're paying for them because their, their income, their wealth, is based on, as the socialists at the time would have argued, um, on the uh, labor uh, value of work, uh, profits taken from the wages of other people. They are arguing they want to cut taxes. They want to lower, in fact, the wages of city employees. Public employees, again, were being subsidized, paid for by the taxpayers. But while they're arguing that government services should be cut, it's instructive to get a sense of their self-interest in noting that they did want government to improve the docks, because that was the basis of commerce. Um, the quid pro quo for this, and again to suggest their complexity, the same time as that they pressed for better docks, they did press for improved housing from the poor. That's the kind of environmentalism uh, theme that we suggested that was a kind of a reform impulse that was also a part of what we might call the carrot rather than the stick of their policy. They, in fact, are successful in 1872, and they gain power with the election of Mayor Havermeyer, who does lay off the workers. He's also the person, as you may recall, who allows the police to wade in to the Haymarket, I'm sorry, to the uh, Tompkins Square uh, protest for jobs when the Depression erupts in 73 and, June of, and January of 74. The committee, 70, this new elite power, represented by people who self-style themselves as reformers, to reform society, always under the assumption that reform is to make it better, and it did, albeit, as we see, largely in their interest. What it did know, according, what it did do as well, according to Beckert, the historian Beckert's vision about this emerging bourgeoisie, was that it cemented bourgeois dominance. Again, at the time, that the bourgeoisie was not inclined to want to talk about itself as a class, arguing that class was something that only radicals talked about. The irony, according to Beckert, is that this bourgeoisie, and I think he's right, was in fact defining itself and being made during the same period, the last half of the 19th century, in this era we often call the Gilded Age. With the consolidation of the bourgeoisie as a national and local power, it also begins to acquire cultural and local political power. It has its own cultural capital as well as its financial and political capital. And it's that cultural capital that we need to talk to address as well. It would be represented in a kind of conservative cultural impulses that we would see in Anthony Comstock in the anti-pornography campaigns in the 1880s in New York. Anti-prostitution campaigns in the 1890s and 1900 around um, exaggerated fears about white slavery, which become, again, attacks often on or desires for arguing that men need to be there to protect women with the new uh, professional roles and authority that would be given to male doctors, male inspectors of the police, male judges, all to deal often with uh, white and immigrant women. What makes this possible is not just the fears that are animated by the Paris Commune, but of course the organization of the working class during the Depression from 73 to 77, the organization of the working class that we've traced 
during the 1880s uh, that leads to large-scale demonstrations in Union Square around May Day in 1886 and afterwards. But as central to it is simply the scale of the bourgeoisie, the very fact that New York City itself is a city of 1.2 million means that the bourgeoisie can be a fairly small number of people. But it's a small percentage of a very large group. And if we take the 1.2 million in Manhattan and add a million in Brooklyn and the other boroughs, and if we're dealing with only 1 or 2 percent, well, 1 or 2 percent of a small town in an upstate New York is not enough to sustain many cultural institutions. But 1 or 2 percent in a city the size of New York makes it possible for this new kind of elite, financial and political elite, to support a whole range of social and cultural institutions that can both unite them and strengthen them. It provides in this growing population that there is a core, a nucleus of rich financiers, of bankers, of industrialists to maintain these institutions, from an opera to a library to social clubs. The city has become a center for manufacturing and for finishing goods, but it is in that has become a center for a city that is not just about labor, but is also about consumption. For not only does this enormous labor force need to be clothed, but there is this new social class of people who are associated with class markers defined by levels of consumption. It will be what that new New Yorker at the turn of the century, Thorsten Veblen, will call the theory of the leisure class, a class that will be defined by what he called conspicuous consumption, the notion that one adorns oneself as a marker of one's superiority, of one's betterness. This new bourgeois, professional, managerial class, people who are not just absentee owners, but now the people managing, providing this white collar force of managers, of public relations people, people who will be in service, all are defining themselves around the kinds of clothes they wear, the kinds of places they frequent, places and clothing that will mark them as respectable at home and at work and at play. Some of the places that they live that reflect these kind of new homes that they would live in are seen up and down Fifth Avenue. J. Pierpont Morgan's mansion, 1903, on Madison and 36th Street, was a clear symbol to people, not the modern taxi cabs from this picture, but a clear symbol to people that this is how a grand person would live and a house in which architecture is meant to be a social and political statement. People like Morgan and others would then go to the new large department stores that they would own, which were built to be grand because people who went in them were meant to have a grand experience. A.T. Stewart, this is the earliest of these large department stores, and it's below Chambers Street. The new department stores quickly move north. Above the new St. Nicholas Hotel, where they can again show their status in the fine hotels that will be built, the St. Nicholas Hotel would have um, marble, six-story facade, 800 rooms, hot running water, a telegraph in the library, central heating, gas lit chandeliers, a steam laundry in the basement, opulent parlors and dining rooms where they would be waited upon by liveried Irish servants. Again, the poor dressed up to serve them well. But it was a place in which they not only were to be treated well, it was a place in which simply in entering it, they were meant to be transformed into the grand people they presumed themselves to be. They would spend their time there, 
visiting. Others would, again, we're here now in again, rich houses, the Duke House in 1912, but they would move after 1900 to the new department store, Ladies Mile, that emerges north of 14th Street, between 14th Street and 23rd Street. The Ladies Mile opens um, right at, in the 1880s. What's remarkable about these stores and these shops is that they are not only massive and grand, but they're built in, in a very short period of time. This uh, is the uh, Adams Dry Goods store. Hugh O'Neill's is the one below it, to, the, to, the, to its uh, facing it to the, to the left in the image, and below it even further down was uh, Simpson and Crawford. The grandest, this is the O'Neill store. This is B. Altman. And this was the grandest of all the stores, the Siegel Gooper store. This store, might be amazed to know, was built in all of six months and transformed the neighborhood. The store, however, had a life expectancy of all of only 20 years. So wealthy people went into these stores. Each of these stores pioneered the new kind of advertising associated with consumption. This particular store, Siegel Cooper, which was the grandest of all these stores with a very famous fountain in the center. People often would say, I'll meet you at the fountain. But what was grandest about this particular store and marked its entry into the advertising industry was it pioneered the use of free samples, the kind of way we experience places like Whole Foods now in New York, places that provide small samples of the food that we would have. The earlier other stores that we've shown you here, B. Altman, that store pioneered the picture windows at the bottom of the, at the, bottom of the store that it also used. So what we have is simply a whole new level of consumption in which people can dine in elegance and they can shop in elegance. What made all of this possible, of course, was the development of a new technology. It was called the elevator. Elevators allow the city to rise vertically above the five stories. The technology is very simple in the beginning. It's a steam and drum method in which a steel wire is run over a drum at the top of a shaft, and the drum is rotated, revolved, to raise and simply lower the cab in which people are, would ride. The alternative was to simply fill a bucket with water from a tank at the top and allow the weight of the water to raise the cab and then empty at the bottom and let the cab rise again under its own weight. These primitive technologies, of course, would eventually be replaced by the Otis elevator comes dominant after the turn of the century. But as early as 1875 in New York, Western Union opens a 10-story, 230-foot building with an hydraulic gravity elevator. So the elevator makes possible the development of all of these new kinds of palaces of consumption. They last all of 20 years because one of the things that's built into consumption, and it's built not just into the clothing we would wear, and it becomes a hallmark of this new kind of industrial capitalism of finishing goods was built in obsolescence. And it wasn't just that the clothing would need to be replaced by something called fashion, but the whole stores were replaced. These stores last all of 20 to 30 years. By World War I, the entire ladies' mile closes down and remains basically undeveloped for most of the next century. It's only been in the last 20 years that it's been redeveloped. Brooklyn Bridge, trains, all make possible the development of a new kind of movement of new towns. Central Park opens. It provides promenades where the wealthy are free to walk and show off their status, especially to escape from the Lower East Side and claim their own space. So, as someone like Kathy Pice in Cheap Amusements describes for you how Italian working class women are taking over the streets to claim it for their space and to be able to use it in new ways, the bourgeoisie is claiming its own kind of new bourgeois spaces. It's both the spaces of these new grand hotels, it can be the spaces of these new emporiums to shopping, 
and it can be places to display yourself, not just in your fine home, but display yourself on the streets of the fine places in New York. The promenades of the park are one such place. As important, however, to all of this were the theaters that would develop for the rich as well. The most famous of this, of course, was the development of vaudeville as a class experience. The great vaudeville houses open just north of the Ladies' Mile. Proctor's Music Hall is the uh, initially on 9th Street between 6th and 7th Avenue, moves up to 14th to 23rd Street between 6th and 7th Avenue. Lily Langtree, Lottie Collins, the Tara Boomdier girl are all there. The Edwin Booth Theater is at the corner of 23rd Street and 6th Avenue, the head of the Ladies' Mile. Edwin Booth, the brother of John Wilkes Booth, a famous actor himself, is Edwin Booth, despite his brother's notoriety, is able to open a theater um, right after the assassination of Lincoln and cater to this new elite, wanting, again, places to be able to create its own kind of alternative elite culture during this period. Madison Square is located, again, at 23rd Street. It's now the present site of the New York Life Building, but Madison Square Garden, created in 1879, rebuilt in 1890, located again on 23rd Street, just north of this new area of consumption. These class spaces are largely to serve the genteel. Vaudeville, after, after, after all, was a French word with, that was meant to have particular appeal to the respectability and to class. But we know that in its experience, it increasingly came to have cross-class experience. And it's worth understanding something of the competing interests of the new cultural capitalists. That they had an interest in creating a space that could appeal to the rich, but ultimately if they were going to be successful as entrepreneurs, it was in their interest to create a space that would sell more tickets and that would have room for more patrons. In order to do that, it was in their interest, on the one hand, to create an elite space where they could be respectable, and then on the second hand, to create a space that would bring in those people who um, were of the lower social orders. The job then means to create, however, a space that can have cross-class appeals, but can market respectability across those class divisions. And part of the project of these new cultural capitalists is to create a broadened class uh, cultural experience that cannot reinforce working class culture, but can begin to embourgeois the working class, if you'd like. Create a working class that can share values of respectability with the elites. Some of that comes in the new creation of mass culture around vaudeville, and later it will be around movies and radio. It's about increasing audience, increasing sales, but maintaining certain moral lessons. All of this can be seen in a final example I wish to turn to. That's your Madison Square Garden I wanted to show you a picture of, 1990. by a final discussion about baseball. Because the example of baseball is one that suggests in its transformation from a class experience in the 19th century to a citywide cross-class spectator sport in the 20th century, how culture is transformed in New York much as class is trying to serve multiple masters. It involves what we might call the commodification of play with multiple class meetings. You'll see some of that when you read Kathy Pice, the multiple meanings of that experience in her discussion of Coney Island. But we turn now to baseball. <laughs> 
Baseball begins in New York in the middle of the 19th century. The first baseball team is called the Mutuals. It's formed in 1857, and it joins the National League at its founding in 1876. They initially played on Hoboken's Elysian Fields. The key, though, is to understand that the Mutuals are themselves already a new phenomena. Baseball before that, in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, bears a remarkable similarity to games like rounders and in some ways to cricket, English games, and was often played in working class communities which were organized around the workplace. So mill one might be playing mill two in a game. The association was that it was a working class sport and a sport organized around community whether it was a community at home or a community at work. But it was a participant sport, not a spectator sport. The development of the mutuals is the transformation of the sport to a spectator activity for which one would pay to participate and from a community-based to a city-based identity. You would now identify with the Mutuals as a City of New York team, joining the National League to play against that team called the Red Legs from Cincinnati, or a team from Worcester, Massachusetts, or the other cities that were first founding this new sport. A new team, a second team, is formed called the Metropolitans in 1880 as an independent professional team by a businessman, John D. Day, and a baseball manager named Jim Mutry. The key is that this is being organized as a business activity. It's not being organized as a form of community solidarity and play. It's being organized as a new thing called an entertainment industry in New York. An industry in the commodification of culture for sale becomes a hallmark of a new emerging way in which people come to understand and experience class, both the earlier working class and this new bourgeoisie. And it's the latter, the bourgeoisie, that becomes the most active agent in the creation of this new culture, even as a working class has the capacity as agents, as participants, sometimes to give it a range of different meanings, as you will see in the Coney Island experience. Culture cannot always be controlled by its creators. It's often given new meanings by the people who participated. That's why we who write books often complain when critics criticize a book that we say, well, we didn't write that book. You have no control over the meanings that people give to a culture. This is nonetheless a new business enterprise. The Metropolitans play their games in Brooklyn, in Hoboken, New Jersey. However, in 1880, in September, the new owners find a polo field to the north of Central Park, near 110th and 112th Street, and they make that the new homes of this new professional baseball team in New York. It's called the Polo Grounds, and it is the first, quote, professional baseball park in New York, just as professionalism is becoming, remember, the byword for the police, byword for the firemen. It is now a byword for all kinds of new workers, if you'd like. The Mets, as they were called, enter a new baseball association called the American Association. Mutri buys another team from Troy, from Troy, New York, called the Troy Trojans. They were earlier called the Haymarkers. And he brings them to New York and names them the Gothams in 1883. And they join the National League. Without a long and detailed chronology, what's interesting about all of this is simply that Mutri later moves over to manage the Mets and then re-Christians them, the New York Giants. The origins of New, of New York City's New York Giants, the team that in 1956 forsakes the city and moves to San Francisco, is in this team, the Gothams, that had existed in the 1880s in New York City. Mutri sells the old Mets to, to another businessman, 
who brings them to Staten Island. That group is later sold and moves to Brooklyn, and they ultimately become the Brooklyn Dodgers. So the Mets become the Dodgers, the Gothams become the Giants. Both get sold out in New York in, 18, in 1956, and the new team that then's formed in New York City, the National League team, takes its name from these early teams, of course, and names itself the Mets. So much for that chronology of the baseball teams. More important to our story is that cross-class alliances or cross-class experience becomes more fundamental to the ways in which people understand and participate in baseball. And they come to identify with the team not as a team that represents their community or their mill, but rather that represents their city against another city. To be loyal to a city, not to a mill, not to a class, becomes critical. And it is a class, it is a city in which there is no division in the baseball world between rich and poor. You go to the baseball stadium and you sit alongside, well, some distance from the rich or poor given the price of seats. But you all watch the same game together and you root for the same side. There is no division, as it were. Now, as we know from the lecture previous, what we'd seen taking place in Tompkins Square Park, Washington Square Park, Union Square, that not all buy into this ideology of classlessness, as we've seen. The alternative was to consolidate power, to create a network for the flow of capital. Cultural capital was one thing. The other was to create a network for the people who do the work, human capital. The consolidation of the city in 1898 is the physical marker of this reconsolidation of economic and social power. The Brooklyn Bridge had established and concretized the tide of Manhattan, but many who worked on Wall Street lived in Brooklyn Heights and needed a quicker and faster way to go. They also needed a way to consolidate their identity with Manhattan and improve it. Brooklynites needed water, New York had it. The mode for this new kind of opposition was to press for a new consolidated city, that Brooklyn, Queens, the Bronx were to be consolidated with Manhattan. Not everyone supported it. Working people saw no advantage and lots of tax costs. And Brooklyn nativist elements opposed it and formed a league of loyal citizens in Brooklyn, led by the Reverend Storrs, the Congregationalist Minister at Brooklyn Heights Church of the Pilgrims, who argued that we need to keep, he called, the political sewage of Europe out of Brooklyn and preserve Brooklyn, in his words, as a New England and American city. Storrs managed to block the consolidation in 1895, but the consolidation movement reorganizes and it passes in 96. And in 1898, the city of New York would be consolidated. Equally important to the task was to create next a transportation network that would make that consolidation visible and physically plausible. And that story, the story of the New York subways, will be the subject of our next lecture.